Hi everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel. This is Tashwita Gupta, your mentor for IFRS. So I am teaching ACCA students for SBR and FR subjects. Plus I'm also taking up Diploma IFRS. So if you are planning to give Diploma IFRS in the next attempt, that is upcoming December attempt, then make sure that you WhatsApp me if just in case you require some online classes. Apart from that, this session is primarily for a fast track revision of all the IFRSs. Now, these IFRSs are common to many qualifications, but I am just emphasizing on Diploma IFRS students. And if you want to use it in your respective qualification, which could be any CMA US, ACCA, whatever, you can use these as well. So this is just an IFRS training session for all the Diploma IFRS students who are giving their exam this June. So make sure that you have your cup of coffee with you and you are attending this session with utter attention and you are getting what I'm trying to say. Okay, so we will have a fast track revision of important standards. I'll tell you that if this is something that you've already done, like if this is the basic level of the IFRS, if you are doing Diploma IFRS after ACCA, so you've done this in FR, the, you, this is something that you must have done in SBR, and this is the advanced level. So I'll tell for every standard that this is the basic level, and then this is the advanced level of that standard. So I hope everyone is going to enjoy this session. So make sure that you do drop a like, comment and share this video and subscribe to my channel after you watch this revision series. So let's get started. Okay, so just for my introduction, first of all, I am Tashwita Gupta. As I said, I am training ACCA subjects FR, SBR online at Wifi. So if you want to enroll for that also, you can DM me on my WhatsApp number, which is displayed on the screen. I am one of the world's youngest ACCA affiliate. I have qualified my ACCA when I was 18 years old. Since then, I am training students for IFRSs and Diploma IFRS that is offered by ACCA, FR and SBR. So there are a lot of helpful content for FR and SBR also on my channel, which you guys can view. Then I have worked in IFRS compilation and UK GAP. So my practical experience is also related to accounting standards. I've taught 10,000 plus students globally with 10 plus rank holders in ACCA, FR, SBR, AA and AAA in three years of my tutorial. So this is my basic introduction. I'm sure no one is least interested in this. But yes, just for my introduction, so that you can rely on this video, you can rely on whatever contents are being taught in this video. So let's get started without any further delay with the conceptual framework. So guys, whenever the IFRSs are framed, something that we should know is, what is the underpinning set of theoretical principles on which my IFRSs are based? What basically IFRS is? So IFRS is a mode of communication. It's a type of language. I am an accountant. You are my stakeholder. So I need to have a language with you for communication. Let's suppose you're from South India and I'm from North India, if you know India. So in North India, we speak Hindi and in South India, we have different languages, Telugu, Malayalam. And if I want to communicate with you, I would be communicating in English, right? So English is a global language. This is country specific example that I've given you. There can be, there can be multiple countries on a global level. If I'm talking to a French person, I talk in English because I don't know French, right? Similarly, if a company is there in overseas, it's, it's outside your domestic country. So it will be reporting its accounts in a global language that is known as International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS. And that's what this session is all about, IFRSs. So what is conceptual framework? To set any language, we first need to have some principles on which our standards will be based. So what are the principles on which IFRSs are based? We should always, we should always present something in our balance sheet, in our PNL, in our OCI, in our cash flow, whichever is giving us faithful representation and relevant information. So this is the term you'll use again and again in Diploma IFRS as well. So you're going to say that, okay, what is faithful representation? Faithful representation means CNF, 
that is complete information neutral from any biasedness and free from error that's what faithful representation is faithful representation also includes one more thing that is substance over form so faithful representation is not just giving the information that is complete neutral and free from error but it also includes substance over form now what is substance over form you must understand that every transaction that a business enters into has many as aspects to it one is the legal aspect another is the economic substance so when i consider economic substance over the legal form that is when i'm saying substance over form give me an example out of your i files this is a fast track revision that means you've already prepared something so for example sale and lease back i files 16 everyone knows that right sale and lease back so sale and lease back means you actually legally made a sale you did sell your uh, property to someone and rent it back that is what lease back is but still you refer to ifrs 15 to consider whether it was a sale or not so that means legally it was a sale but economic substance is something i need to consider so i refer to ifrs 15 to see whether the control has passed or not so that, that is substance over form So you, you can, can find this information as a direct question, or maybe as an MCQ for other students. So you need to remember that yes, substance over form in IFRS is very important. So if I talk about group accounts, consolidation, even group accounts is there because we follow substance over form, right? Then what is relevant? Which information is relevant? The information which is material. the information which is material is relevant what do i mean by material anything whose omission whose omission whose misstatement or obscurement now the new term was added very recently to the definition of materiality or its obscurement is going to lead is going to lead or is going to affect the economic decision of the user is known as material so if i say guys i did not write this thing in my financial statement i wrote it wrong i incorrectly accounted for it so will your decision be affected to invest in my business if yes then that thing is material if no then that thing is not material so that is what we are trying to say over here that we have to consider whatever thing is material in the financial statement should be reported so if that is the case then we are reporting relevant information we are not talking about or we are not beating the bush around right so that's what relevance is then when to recognize an element in financial statement and when to derecognize an element in financial statement very important for all of us to know we recognize something whenever it is having a faithful representation and it is giving us relevant information right that's when we recognize something and we can reliably estimate that particular thing that is very important if you cannot have a measure of what is the uh, you know amount to be reported with regards to that thing in our financial statement then we will not record it so faithful representation relevance and reliable measure and secondly when do we derecognize something when the control has passed control means now you do not have the risk and reward of that particular thing you don't have the r and r risk and reward so this is what is the conceptual framework and there are some other qualities of the financial statements as well that is they should be comparable they should be neutral they should be timely understandable and verifiable so they, these are the secondary qualities of financial statements so we know our objective is to make financial statements now we also know that this objective should also meet certain sub objectives or the financial statement should have these qualities right so primary qualities faithful representation and relevance secondary qualities the comparability the timeliness the understandability and the verifiability so now you know what we need out of the financial statements so accordingly our accounting standards are Right. Now let's move on to the accounting standards. First of all, we have IS sixteen or the non-current asset section. So what IS sixteen is all about? So IS sixteen talks about property, plant, and equipment. Right? It talks about property, plant, and equipment. 
what is pp first you should know the definition of pp anything that is held for more than one year is first of all your non current asset so it is being held for more than one year then the definition includes something which is used in manufacturing process right it is used in manufacturing process like a factory or something which is used for administration now administration means it can be an office or something administration thirdly it is for owner occupied property that has been rented owner occupied property that has been rented i'm sure you guys must have been aware of the concept of pgs paying guest so the owner stays at the ground floor the first the second and the third floor are given on rent so if you are occupying the property and you are also giving it out on rent then that is is 16 property plant and equipment or you're giving things on rent to your employees so employees are going to help you in administration but you gave out the property on rent to them so that is basically your property plant and equipment so you should know what is the meaning of ppe then how do we account for it how do we account for the ppe initially so initially guys we account for the ppe under uh, you know cost method we take the purchase price of that purchase price the price at which i bought that asset in that i'm going to add the directly attributable cost always remember that training cost is not directly attributable what is directly attributable cost the cost which is associated with bringing the assets to its ready for use situation so if i buy a washing machine the installation cost that i pay to install it the cost of carriage inwards bringing in the uh, washing machine in the premises installing it all of that is directly attributable cost right and that is capitalized that means it is added to the cost of the asset then dismantling cost dismantling cost now dismantling is an unavoidable expense if you uh, set up a plant and machinery and you will have to dismantle it after the life of the asset is over now i can't debate about this that whether i will dismantle it or not it is unavoidable i'll have to do that so something which is unavoidable is created as a provision under is 37 so we also create a provision for dismantling cost we calculate the present value of it and whenever we calculate present value the sibling of present value is unwinding of interest so unwinding of interest is my journal entry initially to record this dismantling cost will be asset debit asset debit because i'm capitalizing this cost and provision for dismantling credit by what amount by the present value of that amount by the present value of that amount right i'm going to take the present value then subsequently i am going to effect this provision subsequently means at the reporting date i will unwind the interest on this provision where i will say finance cost debit finance cost debit and my provision for dismantling cost credit so each year i am going to unwind the interest so whatever discounting factor you use to calculate this present value the same factor you will use to unwind the interest then you also uh, capitalize the borrowing cost that we will do in is 23 then you also capitalize your uh, the irrecoverable tax right so i hope everyone is aware of what is irrecoverable tax so if i am not vat registered but i get into some purchase of maybe an equipment laptop or machinery where i end up paying gst now i cannot claim i cannot claim a deduction for the gst that i have paid because i am not gst registered i am not vat registered for other countries so that means that tax that i ended up paying is irrecoverable so if you guys buy iphones we try to save the tax isn't it we try to find a gst number so that we can save that 18% that's what i'm talking about so if you would have been the gst registered person you would have been able to save that tax but if you are not you end up paying that tax you get no refunds for it and that is added to the cost of the asset so that becomes a cost what is the subsequent treatment of ia 16 property plant and equipment now when i talk about subsequent treatment i am basically talking about the reporting date right now what is my what is my 
treatment on the reporting date for that particular ASA. That's what we will consider here in the subsequent treatment. So subsequently, guys, we have two methods. One is cost model. Okay. One is cost model. Another is revaluation model. So I'll consider both of them individually. In the cost model, we have simple valuation of the asset at the carrying amount. What is the carrying amount? Cost of the asset minus any accumulated depreciation minus any impairment for the year that is going to give me the carrying amount of the asset. What is revaluation model? Revaluation model is where I basically take the gain or loss if the gain or loss happens. Gain or loss on what? I value my asset at fair value. Do I take it to fair value at each report date? No. I take it to fair value at regular intervals which are not defined. But yes, we say that we take it to fair value whenever the movement in fair value is significant. Right? So whenever the movement is significant. So I am going to take the gain in the fair value through other comprehensive income because it is unrealized. I am going to take the loss through first of all it's treated like revaluation downwards. It's treated like impairment. Always remember this. Revaluation downwards is nothing but just impairment. So impairment, what is the accounting treatment for impairment? You first take the loss out of any revaluation surplus which existed for that particular asset. If not, then you take it directly from P&L and you credit the asset. Right? So this is the journal entry for revaluation down. That is first take it out through revaluation surplus. Then if you don't have it or it's less, then you take it out through P&L and then you credit the asset. Right? So that is about revaluation model. And always remember, do we, whenever we dispose that asset off, whenever we dispose the asset, we transfer the value in the revaluation surplus, which was created via OCI, to retained earnings. Now, that is the reserve transfer that takes place when the asset is disposed. And we cannot do cherry picking. Just like you cannot do cherry picking in your diploma IFRS exam, similarly, you cannot do cherry picking in the evaluation model. So, this is the treatment of various standards uh, various rules under IS 16 revaluation mod, right? Now let's move ahead to IS 40. That is basically your investment property. Now, as I said, PPE is used in, you can say, PPE is used in manufacturing, rentals, administration. IS 40 is a property that is used for capital appreciation. Now, that capital appreciation means that it is lying idle. It is lying idle. I just bought a property and I've just kept it there. I'm not using it in the business. I've not rented it out. That means I'm going to gain from the fair value movement of that property. So, capital appreciation is what I keep my IS40 investment property for. Then, I also keep my investment property or I might keep my investment property for renters. For example, if I don't stay in the PG, but I have a whole uh, block of, you know, just like a hostel where I give the apartments on rent or Airbnbs, where basically I don't stay, but yeah, it is giving an on, given up on rent. And that is not to the employees, it is to the third parties. So that becomes my investment property. Initial treatment of investment property is just same as IS-16, but there is a difference in subsequent treatment. So subsequently, we have two models. In IS-16, we had a revaluation model. Fair value model is there in IS-40. And cost model is also there in IS-40. There are two models, subsequent treatment, fair value model and cost model. Now, the cost model is exactly the same as IS-16. But if I talk about fair value model, there is a difference between fair value model and the revaluation model. So let us understand the difference between these two. Revaluation model said that you are going to take it to the fair value at regular intervals which are not defined. Uh, so we primarily take it whenever the gain is significant. Then here it was given that depreciation will happen on the revalued amount. There is no change in that. Then the gain was going through OCI. I am revising everything. And the loss was going through P&L primarily. 
unless there was a revaluation surplus previously. Fair value model says, okay, you can take it to fair value at each reporting date. Now that is the first major difference. Here it was regular intervals, here it is at each reporting date. Then here they say there will be no depreciation. Why no depreciation under fair value model? Because already I'm taking the asset to its fair value at each reporting date. Then why in the world I will charge depreciation on that? Depreciation is an estimate. If the estimate changes, it will be reflected in the fair value right then whatever is the gain or the loss will go into statement of profit and loss in case of is fork so these are few of the differences between revaluation model and fair value so i'm sure you'll remember this so let's move ahead okay is 38 intangible assets now guys intangible assets is a very important standard okay here we talk about the assets which we must know are just recorded whenever they are identifiable. What do I mean by identifiable? Something which is separable. That means I can sell it separately. I can sell it separately. That means it has its standalone selling price. That's when an asset is separable. Secondly, or it is arising out of a contractual. It is arising out of a contractual or legal right so if this criteria is met then only i record an intangible asset because why this is extra criteria given to us in is 38 it was not there in is 16 because usually the intangible asset if i talk about internally generated brands internally generated goodwill are they separately sellable it's very difficult to ascertain their uh, estimate their cost what what is their value so if you cannot estimate or have a reliable estimate of the valuation of that asset, you never record it. Remember in the conceptual framework I told you, reliable estimate is very, very important. So if reliable estimate is not there of an intangible asset, why would I record it? So, or it is arising out of a legal or a contractual right. Let's talk about an example. You guys have a license, license to drive the car. Now that driving license is not separable. I cannot give my license to you, right? That would be fraud. That would be illegal. But I have a right to drive the car. And if my uh, business is such where I'm driving uh, cars and you know, I'm doing that hospitality thing, tourism thing. So in that case, each of the license that we have or you know, the truck drivers are there who are doing into uh, transportation. So their licenses are their contractual rights, legal rights. They are, you know, identified and they are identifiable and they are treated as an intangible asset in the financial statements, right? So it is treated as an intangible asset in any case. Then probable economic benefit. Okay, now what is this probable economic benefit? In conceptual framework in 2010, that is 2010, the definition of the asset was Asset is anything that you control, it gives a rise uh, to something which is going to lead to probable inflow of economic benefits and it is arising out of a past event. That was the previous definition of asset. Now in 2018, the conceptual framework was revised where they said that our definition of asset is anything that you control, that's true, there is no probability concept, anything that we control gives rise to inflow of economic resources which is due to a past event is an asset so that means probability is waived off economic benefit converted into economic resource economic resource is a broader term economic benefit is a smaller term narrower term right so you have to see whether there will be probable economic benefit in the case of ifrs in the case of standard still the wording is probable economic benefit but in the conceptual framework, it is ha it has now changed and now we have no probability concept and we have a new term that is economic resource. So that is an area of, uh, you can say, conflict, which if you are asked theoretically that how conceptual framework is different from various standards, you can state this. Then no physical substance. How is, you know, what is physical substance? If I can touch... If I can touch, see or transfer something, then that has physical substance. If I cannot, then that does not have physical substance, right? 
Okay, guys, so now let us look into the uh, subsequent treatment of intangible acid. So initial treatment of intangible acid is same as IS-16. Subsequent treatment again is same under cost and revaluation re model. The only thing that is different is depreciation. So depreciation is not the word that you use for intangible acids. You use the word amortization. Now when to charge amortization? Whenever the life of the intangible acid is definite, we will amortize it. If the life is indefinite, we are going to conduct annual environment review. So that is it about subsequent treatment of IS-38. Now research versus development. Now that is very important from your exam perspective. What is the difference between research and development? They say that we have to follow pirate. P I R A T E. Pirate. If pirate is met, then it is development. If pirate is not met, then it is expense, that is research. So research cost is expensed as it is. Development cost is capitalized. So how do we know what it is? I need to see. I need to see the pirate conditions. What are the pirate conditions? Let's look into that. So P stands for that it will give rise to probable economic inflow of resources. Probable economic resources inflow. Economic benefit inflow. Right? That is what is there in pirate P. Again, that is against conceptual framework. Then I stands for intention. That means whatever you are researching or, or whatever you are developing, you have an intention to use it or sell it. R stands for that you have the resources to do that. Right? A stands for that you have the ability. Means you have the ability to actually, you have the ability to actually do the research, complete the research and use it thereafter. T stands for technical feasibility. Technically, it can be done as well. Technically feasible. E stands for that I will have a reliable estimate of it. So, if all these pirate conditions are met, that is when we call it as development or else we call it as research. Now, you know, uh, if there's a case study, how we are going to apply this pirate condition. Now, that's it about IS-38, IS-40 and IS-16, three important NCA standards. Now, let's move forward to other NCA standards which are less important or you can say are easy. One is government grant, IS-20 government grant. So, if you are, if you have already done the preparation once, you must be knowing what government grant is. So, government grant is an aid given by the government for either meeting an expense. So, when we get grant from the government to meet an expense, we call it as revenue grant. If we get aid from the government to buy some ACE or develop some ACE, that we call it as capital grant, right? Whenever the grant is accorded, when, when and only when, the conditions attached to the grant are fulfilled. Conditions are fulfilled. That's the only when you record the grant income. If the conditions are not fulfilled, I will not record the grant income. Then, uh, what is the revenue grant? What is the accounting treatment for revenue grant? We have two methods. So, one is method number one. In the statement of profit and loss, you show your expense on the debit side and you show your grant income on the credit side, right? That is the method number one for presentation. That doesn't affect the profit. Second method again for presentation for the revenue grant is that you record the expense for which you're getting the grant. Let's suppose that was of 1000 and you record the grant income also here. Let's suppose it was of 500. So you show a net expense of 500 rather than disclosing grant income separately on the credit side. These are the two methods available for revenue grant. Then what are the methods for capital grant? In capital grant, you basically have method number one, where in SFP, this is your traditional SFP, this is your asset side and this is your liability side, right? So one is, let's suppose we are getting uh, aid of $1,000 to buy an asset of $20,000. So on the asset side, I saw uh, I show a net asset of nineteen thousand. That means I say, okay, my asset was of worth twenty thousand, and I'm getting a grant of one thousand for it. So my total asset is of nineteen thousand. Then another is that I show on the liability side. That is second method is this is my asset side, this is my liability side. So on my liability side, I separately show 
deferred income of 1000 and here i show the asset of 20000 now that is fine again that's just presentation but this thing is also affecting the profit how let's talk about depreciation here so let's suppose the rate of depreciation was 10 percent so here in method number one my depreciation will be 10 percent of 19000 that is 1900 here my depreciation will be 2000 that is 10 percent of 20000 so that is affecting the profit so what we do to resolve this accounting mismatch to resolve this we take the or we credit the deferred income we credit the deferred income each year we credit the uh, deferred income from liability to the p and l so every year journal entry is the liability is debited deferred income is debited and the p and l is credited by the rate of depreciation that is 10 percent so every year 100 out of this will be recorded as income in p and l so now what will be your net expense if you recorded expense of 2000 and income of 100 now your net expense is 1900 which is same as method number one that means mismatch resort if you didn't understand it just reverse this one and listen to it carefully right so that's it about government grants let's move to is 23 borrowing cost okay so the borrowing cost guys what basically borrowing cost is let's look at that okay borrowing cost so whenever you buy whenever you buy a qualifying asset whenever you buy a qualifying asset what is a qualifying asset any asset which is going to take substantial period of time for its construction is qualifying asset so if i am going to take a loan to finance my construction of qualifying asset whatever loan i end up paying on that whatever interest i end up paying on that loan is to be financed is to be financed or you can say that finance cost sorry the finance cost that interest cost has to be capitalized that is what borrowing cost is i said that borrowing cost is capitalized initially in is 16 is 38 and then is 40 also so if you take loan to finance your purchase or construction of a qualifying asset then you have to capitalize that finance cost now what is a qualifying asset qualifying asset is any asset which is going to take substantial period of time for its construction so any asset which is going to take substantial period of time for its construction is known as qualifying asset so if i take that means let's suppose it's taking six months it's taking three months so if i take a loan for it i'm going to capitalize the interest on that then if i've taken general borrowings so just one key point if you have taken general borrowings then in that case for example you took a loan of 10 million at the rate of 10 percent and you took a loan of 5 million at the rate of 5 percent to construct a building which was worth 15 million so at what rate will you capitalize the interest you're going to calculate weighted average cost of capital that is 10 millions 10 percent plus 5 millions 5 percent divided by the total amount of loan that is 15 million right so that is your is 23 borrowing cost let's move to our next standard that is is 36 impairment so my impairment what does it mean it means reduction in value of the asset what is impairment reduction in value reduction in value of asset so that is just like revaluation downward so you compare what is impairment first of all you look at the indicators whether they are external indicators or whether they are internal indicators that's your choice whichever indicator you pick up then based upon these indicators you calculate what was the carrying amount of my asset and why compare it with the recoverable amount recoverable amount is higher of value in use and fair value less cost to sell right so i will take the recoverable amount and compare it with the carrying amount so i'll take lower of both of these so if my cost is already lower than recoverable amount no need to impair but if what the cost is at what you've presently recorded your asset so at what price you've recorded your asset is greater than the recoverable amount that means you need to reduce the value of your asset that's when impairment arises right so i'm going to impair my asset i'm going to take it to the lower of carrying amount and recoverable amount now how do i take it to the lower i'm going to first take the loss 
to revaluation re surplus as we said in revaluation downwards further loss is taken to revaluation re surplus then the remaining is taken to the statement of profit and loss and my asset is credited one thing that you guys must know is impairment of a cash generating unit what is a cgu smallest group of identifiable assets which are subject to impairment so uh, why do we need a cgu to calculate value in use let's suppose there is there is a hospital there is one section of dermatology there is one section of uh, heart patients one section of eyes so we will say every you know department every opd uh, is having its own it's having its own customers having its own like i don't feel saying that as appropriate but yes hosp hospital are also a business right so if they are having their own customers so i cannot say the machine in the eye department how much uh, revenue are we generating because of that machine one machine or one fan which is there in the eye department so i will create one cgu of the whole eye department and i'll take the assets the carrying amount of those assets and the recoverable amount of those assets so i compare them and then i allocate the impairment now impairment is first allocated to the damaged asset if in the case study they have written that one asset was damaged so first you'll allocate the impairment to it secondly you're going to uh, allocate the impairment to the goodwill completely thirdly you will allocate the impairment pro rata basis on pro rata basis to all the other to all the other assets so quick question to you do you impair the non current uh, do you impair the current assets no i only impair non current assets what are my current assets think about it receivables inventory already inventory is lower at cost and nrv it's valued under is2 lower of cost and nrv no need to impair it further if you talk about cash cash can it value reduce if you have a note of uh, 500 indian rupees the value will remain same unless it is demonetized and the value remains same right unless it is stolen demonetized etc but it is not impaired right but yes when it is when it is uh, in case of demonetization that's a complex concept that yes in that case if still i have some note like we are uh, saying that we are going to demonetize 2000 indian rupees notes very soon so in that case i would say that yes if i have 2000 rupees that would be impaired there will be a reduction in the value right so i i will derecognize it somehow so basically the point is that current assets in general situation specifically in your exam is not impaired uh, only the non current assets are impaired on pro rata basis right so that is the case of is 36 now ifrs 5 guys ifrs 5 talks about non current assets which are held for sale or the discontinued operation this continued operation let's understand the theoretical aspect of both these things this continued operation so held for sale is whenever any asset we plan to sell is held for sale so what is the accounting treatment accounting treatment is that you value it at lower of cost and nrv lower of cost and nrv that means basically impairing that asset you basically impairing that uh, particular asset so you value it at lower of cost and nrv then you stop depreciating it <clears throat> why will i stop depreciating any asset because i will stop using it something which i'm holding for sale i cannot use it yesterday someone came and saw the asset and wants to buy it he quoted a price we agreed on a price now next day i'm using that asset i'm depreciating it that means it's not ethical something which you have set a price for customers are uh, looking for the you know condition of that asset and you have to sell it in the present condition you cannot depreciate it further so what is discontinued operation then <clears throat> discontinued operation is separate major line of business something that you stopped operating and it was a separate line of business major line of business maybe it was separate major line of business because of its operations or it was a separate major line of business because of its geographical area so kpmg uk is a separate major line of business kpmg india is a separate major line of business then any subsidiary which was bought any subsidiary which was bought with the intention of reselling that is you didn't buy that company for the sake of synergy you bought it for the sake of reselling only so that is also discontinued operation from the very first day 
so what is my uh, what is my accounting treatment for discontinued operation for discontinued operation we look at one line accounting in the statement of profit and loss we will show what is the profit after tax from discontinued operations all the assets and liabilities which are held for sale under the discontinued operation or individually will be treated as current assets or current liabilities that is the accounting treatment and the definition now what basically is the conditions what are the conditions which are to be met before i classify anything as discontinued or held for sale that is capsin so all my students are very much aware of capsin if you don't know it then you're not my student capsin is commitment that i have a commitment to sell that asset i have an active plan to sell that asset that means i am actively locating the buyers i'm actively locating uh, the you know marketing is being done i i have listed my asset on maybe a site like olx so that means i am actively planning to sell that asset and i am doing my activities to sell it then p stands for that the sale will be in present condition then s stands for sale is probable that means it's very probable that you're going to make that sale excuse me for my bad handwriting then the sale will be within one year and there will be no change to the plan delta means change no change to plan if capsin is met that is when we recognize the asset that is when we recognize the asset as held for sale or discontinued operation right so that is it about ifrs 5 that you should know for your diploma ifrs or any subject that you are preparing for let's move to the next bit is 37 very cute standard and in order as well why because here again we consider probability way too much way too much okay so we have things like provision we create provision we disclose contingent liability we disclose contingent liability or we do thing right and then we also have we also have contingent asset and an asset contingent asset or an asset what do i mean by this let's first talk about provision provision is a liability so it should meet the definition of the liability first of all what is the definition of liability something which is my present obligation something which is a present obligation which is going to lead which is going to lead to what outflow of economic resources right which is going to lead to outflow of economic resources is my present obligation arising out of a past event it can be a constructive obligation that means okay i announce that i'm going to do my diploma ifrs revision let's suppose my i had a mood swing and i said i don't want to do it but i have a constructive obligation to do this revision then what is legal obligation if i didn't do this revision today you guys can you guys sue me no because this is non paid right this is not something which i had a contract with you for it so that means legal obligation is by law constructive obligation is voluntary you know by by for the sake of reputation for the sake of your ethics right so provision can be a present obligation legally or constructively and it will lead to probable outflow of economic resources which can be liably estimated liable estimate is something which comes in dancing everywhere reliably estimated right then what is contingent liability contingent liability is created sorry it's disclosed in our notes to accounts only if the situation is that it's not probable probable means the chances are between 50 to 100% when the chances are like from 10 to 50% then we disclose a contingent liability that we might end up paying this after this much years so that is contingent liability contingent asset now since we follow prudence so when it is probable whenever it is probable we create a provision but in case of contingent asset when it is probable that i'm going to receive some money from somewhere then i disclose a contingent asset i don't record that asset unlike liability where i disclose and record provision so contingent asset for example insurance claim you claim something now you don't know whether your claim will be accepted and you will be given the money or not 
So what we do is we disclose a contingent asset. When it is virtually certain, when it is virtually certain that you're going to receive money, then you create an asset. Virtually certain means 95% chance and more. So that's what happens in IS 37. What else is there in IS 37? We all must know that provisions are only created for unavoidable expenses. So we cannot create provisions. We cannot create provisions for future operating losses. You can avoid future operating losses. How can you avoid it? Simply mass of operating company. No need to uh, no need to actually see whether the you know there are operating losses or not. Stop operating at all. So you will not incur losses. Then do we create provision for the so we do not create provision for operating losses. Do we create provision for environment? Yes, we do create provision for environment. We create it on the amount which is unavoidable. That you know we have constructive obligation for the uh, maybe the restoration cost. We polluted a site, now we need to restore it. So what will be the cost of it? Let's create a provision over it. Then restructuring. What is restructuring? So if a company is laying off certain employees, so you do not create a provision for ongoing activities. Restructuring means, let's suppose I said from the branch of teaching, I want to transfer my employees to consultancy. Now consultancy and teaching are both ongoing activities. On the other side, uh, on the other side I'm saying I'm stopping consultancy business. Now I'll be just sticking to teaching. So in that case, the employees that I'll make redundant from my consultancy business is something which is stopped, discontinued. So I create a provision on redundancy. I do not create a provision on ongoing activity. So relocation cost, restructuring cost, which are related to ongoing activities are not provided for. So that's it for IS 37. I hope everyone is enjoying this session and you got to know about IS 37 completely. Okay, so if you would have any doubts in the middle, I'm just saying it. If you would have any doubts, you can WhatsApp me. I can make you part of a WhatsApp group for IFRSS where you can ask your doubts directly to me, right? So you can DM me on my WhatsApp and of course, you can ask the doubts in the comment section as well. Okay, now let's move to the next bit. IS 12. So this is on taxes. So first you should know there are two types of taxes. One is current tax, right? And other is deferred tax, current tax and deferred tax. Current tax, deferred tax. Okay. So in current tax, what we have is we create our tax liability based upon current tax rate. That is the corporation tax. The tax that you pay on company, company tax, right? Which in UK is, when I did my exam, it was 19%. I don't know what it is right now. So current tax is uh, on the corporation tax, on the profit that you pay. That concept also has under provision and over provision. Under provision and over provision. What is under or over provision? Under is... Let's suppose previous year I said my estimate of taxation was my estimate of taxation was 1000 but I ended up paying a tax of 1500 that means I under provided in the previous year. So what I will do in the current year I will provide for it. I'll pass a journal entry and debit and my tax liability credit because I under provided in the previous year. What is over provision? Over provision is let's suppose I provided for 1500 I ended up paying 1000 only. So this year I will record a journal which will say tax liability debit and my P&L credit because I over provided in the previous year. Now why do we treat it as normal change? Why don't we treat it as an error? Because you know tax is an estimate. You don't know what you will end up paying versus what you estimate. Now you estimate on the basis of your profit. Now profit is calculated as per the accounting rules but taxation authorities have their own rules. So we cannot estimate it first handedly that how much tax I'm going to end up paying in the upcoming years, right? So my, uh, let's suppose my year has ended on 31st March, but I will be paying tax maybe after nine months, six months. So it's not that today I know how much tax I'll pay after six months. So that is when you file the returns and everything happens. So after the year end, 
maybe in july or so you will file the returns and then you pay the tax in september or january or so so that's a very long process so we cannot say that okay i know what tax i'm paying right so that is for the current tax what about deferred tax now deferred tax arises because there is a difference between accounting rules between accounting rules and taxation rules so let's suppose that in the accounts my uh, carrying amount or my cost of the asset was 1000 my depreciation is 10 percent so my depreciation was 100 and i uh, had a carrying amount at the reporting date of 900 that is according to the accounting rules now taxation authority says okay the cost is 1000 but we do not believe that the depreciation is 10 percent we have our own method of calculating depreciation uh, which they call it as capital uh, you know expense so that might be let's suppose they say we charge a depreciation at the rate of 15 percent so our depreciation is 150 so 1000 minus 150 is what 850 so tax base tax will be calculated on 850 and the carrying amount is 900 now you'll say ma'am then how is this a deferred tax because guys this difference is temporary why it is temporary because both the accounting rules and the taxation rules at the end of the day will take the asset to the zero amount will take to the uh, tax base will also go to zero amount or to the scrap value right so this is a temporary difference now in case of a temporary difference what we do is we calculate what is the difference so in step number two let's see what is my difference difference is of 50 50 dollars is the difference then I'll say in step number three, let's calculate the deferred tax position. Let's suppose the tax rate is 30%. 50 into 30% is 1.5, right? So not 1.5. So it will be 15. So my deferred tax position is of $15. Now I will say whether it's a deferred tax asset or whether it's a deferred tax liability that is what i need to ascertain so i will say if my carrying amount is greater than the tax base what is that i will pay less tax today but i'll have to pay more tax tomorrow so that's a deferred tax liability if my carrying amount is lesser than the tax base that means i'm paying more tax today i'll pay less tax tomorrow so that's a deferred tax asset in this case my carrying amount is clearly greater than the tax base so I am paying tax on my tax base. Today I'll pay less tax. I'll pay tax on 850. But tomorrow, because this is a temporary difference, I will end up paying more tax. So there is a $15 deferred tax liability being created. So this is a $15 deferred tax liability. How do you record this deferred tax liability? You will say I'll record the movement. I'll record a movement in my p and That means I'll show, okay, my deferred tax liability, I'll see what is my opening deferred tax liability. I'll see what my closing deferred tax liability is. And whatever will be the movement will go into statement of profit and loss. Now, if this movement, if this temporary difference was because of revaluation surplus, if that movement was because of revaluation surplus, that shall and must go from OCI. Because revaluation surplus went from OCI. So if there is a movement because of surplus, in deferred tax that should also go through the uh, OCI that is the rule right then in case of provisions in case of uh, let's suppose some specific cases like provisions you provided for something and tax authorities didn't provide for something so your carrying amount will be greater than the tax base right so you will see whether it's a deferred tax liability or deferred tax asset because this is a liability situation. So you will equally see whether it's a deferred tax asset or liability. Very rarely tested. Very important concept in deferred tax is unused tax losses. Unused tax losses. What is there in unused tax losses? We say that if we made losses in previous, let's suppose, two years, 2022 and 2023, we made losses of 1000 and 1500 simultaneously for two years. Now in 2024, they are saying, let's carry forward this loss. If we make a profit, we 
will first deduct these losses from that profit whatever net amount we will get we will end up paying tax on that. So you got a deduction you saved the tax because of these carry forward losses. So this saving of the tax we create a deferred tax asset for it. How much tax will you save? 1000 plus 1500 that is 2500. So you will 2500 into the tax rate right. So you are going to save tax on this. This is the saved tax which you will create defer tax asset. Now the rule says that we only create a defer tax asset in such a situation. We only create a defer tax asset in such a situation when and only when what happens? We create a defer tax asset if we have a solid evidence. If we have a solid evidence that in future year we are going to make profits. There will be future profits. So if you don't have evidence that you want to make future profits, no need to record the defer tax asset. If you will not get this profit at all, how will you claim the deduction? How will you save the tax? Because if in 2024 also I end up making a loss, then anyways I'm saving tax. I don't need to have a deduction for these losses. So you have to see whether there's a solid evidence or not. Now that solid evidence can actually come from uh, you know, customer contracts, you already got some contracts, some customers are interested in your goods and services. It doesn't come from budgets and forecasts because budgets and forecasts are very uh, predictive or you can say it's very professional judgment based, subjective, manipulation can be there. Everyone will say I'm going to do best in the upcoming years, right? Especially the management. So you have to be skeptical about it. So you do not create a defer tax asset unless there is a solid evidence. Then what else do we have in defer tax asset? Now this is the advanced part which you guys must have done in your SBR uh, if you're preparing for diploma IFRS. This is the advanced part. It is not there in your, it was not there in your FR. In the advanced part what we have is when we consider share based payment with respect to IS-12. Now understand this point. Share based payment IFRS 2, let me first, uh, okay, I'll do that towards the end, share based payment, like what is there in SBP. So in SBP, we know for sure that we have to claim certain expense, we get certain expense recorded in the P&L. Now, more expenses you have, you're going to save tax, all of you agree with me on this, we're going to save tax if there is an expense, because that is a deduction from the profit, profit slashes tax is saved. Now, tax authorities say, we will not let you get this deduction unless the share options are actually exercised. So the day they are actually exercised, that is when you can take this deduction, right? So you are going to defer this deduction. So when you defer a benefit, when you defer a benefit, that is known as defer tax asset. So here for this deduction, you're going to make a defer tax asset. How much deduction will I get for this expense? I'm going to get a deduction based upon intrinsic value of this. So I will see what is the intrinsic value and then I'll calculate the expense and I'll multiply it with the tax rate that will give me my defer tax asset for that particular year. Right. Then I will see how much out of this, how much out of this uh, defer tax asset is coming from the expense that I've recorded, equity that I've recorded and how much is coming from the other part, maybe some extra part, maybe I'm getting extra deduction. I've also already recorded some equity in my balance sheet with relation to IFRS 2. So I'll compare how much out of it is greater than the equity that I have recorded. So let's suppose the defer tax asset is 350k and the equity that you've recorded is 250k. So you're getting higher, 100 is the extra amount. So this 100 will go from, this 100 will go from other statement that is OCEI and that 350 will go through, 250 will go through equity, right? So that sort of bifurcation is there. Once again, that's not very much important. You should just know that what defer tax asset is, how it is created in case of share based payment, right? Now let's move to the next bit. We are done with defer tax asset uh, once. IFRS 15 revenue from contracts with customers. 
now guys revenue is anything that arises from my normal course of business normal course of business if today i sell my laptop if today i sell my laptop that is not my revenue but if today i sell my teaching services that's something that i do so that is going to be my normal course of business so money that i get from normal course of business is revenue now revenue is recorded in five steps step number 1 step number 1 is that you identify the contract identify contract so what happens in this case you have to see whether what is a contract a contract is an agreement between two or more parties where both of them have recognized and identified their rights and obligations then secondly this contract is having a commercial substance this contract is having this contract is having a commercial substance right commercial substance is there then what else commercial substance means it's not a charity contract then it's probable that you're going to receive money that means you're not going to have a bad debt the customer is going to pay you so if these conditions are met that is my contract is identified then i have step number 2 step number 2 is where i determine the transaction price or first i identify what are my separate performance obligation separate performance obligation now here it is very important for you to know that what is separate performance obligation within one contract there might be many obligation many promises which the company make to the customer so you have to ascertain which performance obligations are separate separate means distinct what do i mean by distinct performance obligation where i provide distinct goods and services what is distinct they are not dependent they are not dependent that means the goods and services the goods and services delivery of one good or service is not dependent upon the delivery of the second good or service so that means they are distinct right then if you talk about uh, another aspect if they are distinct they will be treated as separate performance obligation you can also see whether these performance obligations have their stand alone selling prices or not that is also one factor through which you can ascertain whether they are distinct or not so basically they are separately sellable or not that's what we will see right then what we have is step number 3 what is the step number 3 determination of transaction price now that is very important transaction price is the price of the contract which you uh, ascertain with the or which you set or settle with the customer so you will see what all things are there within this transaction price so you have a basic transaction price which you set okay i'm going to sell these things at this price contract price then in that you can add variable consideration what is variable consideration the company might say that you know we will charge you this much if this happens or the customer might say i will end up paying you this much if this happens if you completed by this date i'll pay you this so here you calculate expected value what is the probability you will consider that and then you calculate expected value of the consideration and include it just like contingent consideration in your transaction price it must be probable you know it must be very much probable that you will receive that consideration then you also have non cash consideration for example if a company uh, you sell something to them and they pay you in terms of shares in their own company we have share based payment uh, that is a complex standard so they might pay you in terms of shares if that happens we call it as non cash consideration so we record non cash consideration at its fair value fair value of that thing if fair value of that thing is not determinable under ifrs 13 level 1 level 2 level 3 then you say whatever consideration i am receiving if i am not able to ascertain its fair value then what is the fair value of the service or the good that i am providing so that will be known as fair value of non cash consideration which is included in the transaction price then you have a financing component now see guys if i say 
that I'm going to receive the transaction price, let's suppose after two years or three years, whenever the component or the term included, uh, the difference included is more than 12 months, then I need to calculate the present value. So I will say what is the present value of the money that I'll receive after two years. So that would be recorded as transaction price. And of course, when you take present value, you will, your journal entry will be, what will be the journal entry? You'll create an asset receivable debit and my uh, revenue credit transaction price credits the revenue so the receivable will be unwinded that means the interest on receivable will be unwinded winding of interest so every reporting period you will pass your journal entry until you receive that money that my receivable debit and my finance income credit so whenever we calculate present value we have to unwind the interest so that is uh, that is basically the types of considerations that we have right what else now what else do we have in the uh, revenue in revenue we have another step so these are basic considerations that you have then we have another step that is step number four allocation of transaction price to various performance obligations so you allocate the transaction price to various performance obligations where basically you just see that okay if my transaction price is dollar 100 and i am providing various services so i need to allocate this to all of them on prorata basis and similarly the discount will be also allocated to them so let's suppose standalone selling price of all these goods and services is 150 but you're giving them as a bundle of 100 so there's a discount of 50 so 50 will also be allocated on prorata basis to all of the performance obligations then step number five is recognition of revenue. Recognize the revenue. Now here you say recognition of revenue. So here you basically say, okay, I need to see what basically is my uh, revenue recognized that over the period of time or at a point in time. So if my revenue is not recognized over the period of time, it is automatically recognized at a point in time. This is by default method. But when do you record your revenue over the period of time? When any of the three conditions are met. What are these three conditions? First condition, you are enhancing the asset, enhancing the asset owned by customer. Customer owns an asset, I, I am just enhancing it. Customer has a piece of land, I am constructing building on it. So as in when the construction will happen, I will record the revenue. Then what else? Customer is consuming and receiving the benefit, receiving and consuming the benefits simultaneously. Just like this class, I am giving the benefit as in when you are consuming it, simultaneous process. Thirdly, what is it? I am enhancing the asset owned by me. The customer's asset is enhanced, that is first point. But I'm enhancing the asset, which is owned by me only, the company only. But that is no alternate use to us, no alternate use. For example, customized construction. Let's suppose on a beach side, the customer wants an office place. Now you will say on the beach side, nobody is going to buy an office place from me. There will be resorts, hotels, but the customer said, please build it for me. Now he runs away. On the base of the progress that has been done till date, I will recognize the revenue because I get a legally enforceable right of payment in case of customized assets, customized uh, goods and services, right? So that is when we record the revenue over the period of time. Now you should also be knowing few other things. That is, when does the control pass? What are the indicators of control being passed? That is also given to you in IFRS 15. So you say control is passed when the possession is passed, control is passed maybe when the, uh, you know, the legal title is transferred, all these things, when the risk and rewards are being transferred, all these things are important when you certain whether it is sale and lease back or not in IFR is 16, right? So you must know the indicators of controls being passed. Then what else do you have is, uh, how do you treat a contract asset or a contract liability? See, what we do is we have a four-step approach. Step number one is we ascertain from a contract whether we are creating an overall profit from the contract or we are 
creating an overall loss from the contract. If the contract is loss making, we call it as onerous contract and we create provisions on onerous contract. Remember this always. We create provisions on loss making contract. On what amount do we create the provision? Lower of continuing the contract, cost continuing the contract and cost of terminating it. So I take lower of it and that is on what I create a provision for onerous contract. Secondly, what I do is if it's an overall profitable contract, I will have to ascertain what is my progress percentage. What is my progress percentage? Now that can be done on the basis of input method or output method. Input or output method. Input method is based upon you thought that total estimated cost is 1 million and till date you've spent 0 0.8 million. So you will say the progress is 80%. Output method is you said you're going to construct four floors of a building till date you constructed two. So you'll say 50% is the progress. So based upon the results or the cost, we calculate the progress. Then step number three is we record the revenue. We record the revenue and the cost that has to be uh, in the P&L. So cost that is recorded in the P&L is the cost that you've spent till date. Okay. You record revenue that is transaction price into the progress percentage, right? So this is what we record as revenue in the P&L, statement of profit and loss. Then step number four is, step number four is, we see whether we have a contract asset or a contract liability. Contract asset or contract liability. So we see what is the revenue that we have recorded versus how much cash we've received from the customer. So if the revenue that we have recorded till date is greater than the money received from the customer, that means I have received less money, but I've done more work. So I have accrued my income. So that is income accrued. It is income approved, uh, income accrued. That means it's your asset. That is your contract asset. You are yet to receive money. The work has been done, right? Then you have another situation when the revenue that you've recorded is less than the cash that you've received from the customer. So you'll say, I have received more money, but I've given less of the services as of now. So in that case, what is it? It is income received, but not accrued. So in that case, it's your contract liability, right? So if you receive money in advance from the customer, income received in advance from the customer, that is contract liability. Right. All of you should remember that these are the four steps. Now, uh, what else is there in the advanced level of IFRS 15? Something that is specific to you. It's not related to uh, what you've done in FR. Right. You must have done this in SBR. One is contract modification. Contract modification. So what is contract modification? If we change the contract with the customer, we see or we ascertain if the contract modification happens, we ascertain that it can be three types of contract. One is we create a separate contract. One is we create a separate contract. So let's suppose you are taking SDR classes from me and I say, okay, I can give you AAA classes as well, right? That's the traditional example that I use. So you have to see whether it's a separate contract, whether you will terminate the previous contract and create new contract, right? Or what else? Part of the same contract. These are the three, uh, you can say, situations in front of us. So I will create a separate contract if the additional goods and services that I'm providing are distinct, right? That means AAA is distinct from SBR. And the price that I'm charging you for AAA is more or less equal to the standalone selling price of the AAA if I'm selling to any other customer. That means I've not given you any bulk discount. So in that case, I am going to create a separate contract. If I talk about terminating existing and creating new contract, the services or the goods are distinct. That is same. But the discount was given that means the selling price of additional goods is lesser than the fair value of that good 
so that means you were uh, taking sbr from me and you said ma'am i want triple a also so can you give me extra discounts because i've already taken sbr from you so in that case i'm giving you at a lower than standalone selling price so that becomes i will terminate the existing contract and i'll create a new one where i will list sbr and triple a together then if the services are not distinct if the services are not distinct then in that case it will be part of the same contract for example a customer said build a building for three floors now i also want a fourth floor to be built now fourth floor cannot be built up till you complete three floors you can't build it on the air right so that means they are not distinct so that will be treated as part of the same contract so that is what is there in contract modification and that's the end of ifrs 15 revenue okay one more thing last from revenue contract cost very important to all of you contract cost when do we capitalize a contract cost when number one it does not fall under any standard it doesn't fall under any standard that means it is not a material labor or overhead cost it doesn't fall under is2 or any other standard secondly it is directly attributable directly attributable for the uh, the contract cost is directly attributable to the obtaining of the contract that means because you incurred this cost because you incurred this cost obtaining the contract because you incurred this cost that's why you obtained the contract so if you pay a legal fee for a negotiation of the contract now that you would have paid anyway whether you get the contract or don't get the contract but if you paid a special fee due to which you actually got the contract then it will be capitalized right so that's it about ifrs 15 finally now let's move to ifrs 16 quickly ifrs 16 talks about rou that is right of use asset for the lessee perspective i'm talking about i'm not going to talk about lesser much so rou is uh, right of use asset when you take an apartment on rent you get the right to use that asset you can direct the use of that asset there's no restriction on you there can be guidelines that okay you can use it for these purposes but when you start using then nobody can say it, use it this way or use it that way that means you can direct the use of the asset so you create an rou and because you end up paying rental so you create a lease liability also there are various components of lease liability payment maybe a fixed payment that you have to make monthly maybe a variable payment that you have to make based upon certain probabilities maybe a payment or a penalty if it is probable that you're gonna end the lease term very soon or maybe if there's an option to buy the leased asset what is the cost of that and if it is probable that you will exercise that asset uh, that option then what is the probability and what is the price that is added into lease liability so how do you calculate the lease liability initially initially the lease liability is calculated at present value what discounting factor is used the discounting factor used is the interest implicit in lease interest implicit in lease right then what is rou rou is a uh, lease liability lease liability plus any payments made on or before the commencement of lease on or before the commencement of lease so that is Basically, if any uh, security deposit was paid, that will be added to your ROU. Then that is initial treatment. What is subsequent treatment in leases? Subsequently, what happens? The ROU is depreciated. ROU will be depreciated. At what life? You're going to say there are two types of lives. One is lease term. Another is life of the asset. So I'll say whatever is shorter, I'm going to depreciate it using that life. Then lease liability, since it was valued at fair value, so lease liability will see unwinding of interest. There will be unwinding of interest on lease liability, right? Then what happens is for sale and lease back now. Okay, before that, quick look at lesser accounting. In lesser accounting, we say, okay, there is two types of leases. One is operating operating leases operating leases another is financial leases operating leases is basically when you have simple you know what is the lesser the one who gives the apartment on rent right so he has given it simply on rent what is financial lease financial leases when he has practically given the asset to the lessee so for example uh, if the life of the asset life of the building was 10 years 
and the lesser gave it to the lessee for 12 years. So lease term was 12. So practically has transferred the asset. So that means it's a financial lease. In operating lease as in when the rent is received, as in when the rent is received or recruit, you record it as an income. In financial lease, what we do is, in financial leases, we de-recognize our asset. No more, it's our asset now. We de-recognize it and we create a receivable. Whatever rent we receive, whatever rent we receive, that is again treated as interest. Now let's talk about sale and lease back. Sale and lease back, very important concept. So here you basically what we are doing is we sold something legally but we are leasing it back also. So it's a cost cutting technique. It's a cost cutting technique. You sold something and then you are taking it back on rent. So maybe you wanted some money and that's why you sold it but then you also want that asset so you're leasing it back. So sale and lease back very important concept. For that we need to refer as I said we need to refer to IFRS 15 whether it was a sale or it was not a sale. So IFRS 15 will tell you whether it is a sale, it is a sale or it is not a sale. These are the two situations, sale or not a sale. Now for that we will consider the lessee perspective and the lesser perspective. So for the lessee, if it is a sale, that means he's going to de-recognize the asset, de-recognize the asset. It's a revision, guys. That's why we are doing it fast. We're going to de-recognize the asset, create an receivable because it's a sale. So when you sell something, you create a receivable. You will create an ROU and you will create a lease liability and you will also calculate the profit or loss on disposal. If it is not a sale, you'll keep on recognizing the asset. You will not de-recognize it then whatever money that you receive because legally it was a sale so you will receive some money you'll treat it as a loan so you treat it as a financial liability whatever rent you are going to pay that will be treated as finance cost that is what happens when it is not a sale what does the lesser do when it is a sale lesser will uh, if it is a sale lesser will actually you know divide, uh, divided whether it's an operational lease or whether it is a financial lease so based on that, he will do his lesser accounting. If it is not a sale for lesser, because he is giving money, so he will treat it as a financial asset, a loan that is given. And whatever rent is received will be his finance income. Right? And that's what happens in case of sale and lease back. Now, you must know that when I talk about it is a sale, it is a sale. I said you have to calculate profit or loss on disposal. So for that, ROU is calculated in a separate way. So you must be aware of this. ROU is calculated as present value divided by fair value into the carrying amount. Present value divided by fair value into the carrying amount. So there are two types of situations. Let's take an example. Let's take some numerical example. Let's suppose that the fair value of that asset is 1000. Okay. The cost of the asset is 800 and the transfer is at fair value. That means if you are selling it and it is a sale, the transfer is at fair value only. And the lease liability is let's assume to be 900. So how will we calculate our ROU first of all? ROU will be calculated as PV over FV into CA. So my present value of lease liability is 900, fair value is 1000 and my carrying amount is 800, right? So that's how I'm going to calculate it. So basically this is coming out to be how much? 9 into 8 is uh, 8, okay, 9 into 8 is 72, so 720. So my ROU is 720. So my journal entry will be if the transfer is at fair value, bank debit by 1000 because you're going to receive this then rou debit we just calculated 720 then my lease liability credit 900 asset is going we are going to derecognize it so 800 so the total of debit side is 1720 total of credit side is 8 plus 9 is 17 1700 
so there is a difference of 20 so this 20 difference is basically this 20 difference is basically your on the credit side so this is a profit on disposal so profit on disposal is 20 now let's suppose the transfer was above the fair value that means transfer was let's suppose not at 1000 but it was at 1100 so now the debit side becomes 1820 and the credit side is 1700 everything else will remain same everything else will remain same the extra thing that is added is of 100 which is treated as financial liability on the credit side so this is my financial liability of 100 right similarly if the transfer was let's suppose at 900 100 lower transfer 900 now there will be no financial liability so transfer was at 900 now the total is 1620 so there is a balance on the debit side of how much 80 right so you will say how much is this uh, sorry there there is a this is 1720 so there is a difference on the debit side by 100 so that will be treated as prepayment asset prepayment of 100 so what is the conclusion when the transfer is above the fair value transfer is above the fair value then a financial liability is created when the transfer is below the fair value then a prepayment is created that's it so this is what you need to revise from ifrs 16 let's move to the next standard okay before i do ifrs 9 let's quickly revise our groups okay so in group accounts guys for your basics okay what we have in group accounts is we create consolidated financial statements whenever we obtain control what is control control arises when the three things are met you have power over the investee secondly you have the uh, you know right over the variable returns right over the variable returns thirdly what is there you have the ability to affect those returns maybe you are taking you know decisions in the key operations and management and financial decisions so you are able to affect the profit or loss of that company so there are many situations when you might have less than 50 percent of shareholding still you are fed if these three things are met now these three things can be met when i can appoint majority of the board of directors or i have more than 50 percent of the voting right maybe i don't have that much of shareholding so that is when we do consolidation whenever we have control we do consolidation we create consolidated statement of financial position what are the rules for creating consolidated statement of financial position add up everything as if you know everything or add up everything as if you own 100 percent so all the assets and liabilities are added up at 100 percent then eliminate the intra-group transaction you need to eliminate the intra-group transaction because whatever is within the group remains within the group that's when you uh, calculate purp and you eliminate it then what we have is uh, you have the elimination then later on you also show up to the extent you don't own the subsidiary you also show the ncr right so in the consolidation process we create working notes we create working notes five working notes are there in group accounts what are these five working notes working note number one group structure so here you basically identify who is the acquirer and who is the acquiry group structure is when we identify who is being acquired and who has acquired it right and when you do that you also see who is the associate when i say associate associate is basically who has significant influence significant influences power to participate power to participate right ptp power to participate your associate is usually between 20 percent to 50 percent shareholding when you have 20 to 50 percent of voting right usually it is an associate so you create an associate uh, in the group structure you identify who is your associate what is the associate accounting treatment you treat it under is 28 is 28 that is equity method of accounting one line accounting 
right that's what we do for associates working note number 2 is for fair value of net assets of the subsidiary now these fair value of net assets of the subsidiary are taken at the acquisition date are taken at the acquisition date and at the reporting date now these are basically share capital share premium revaluation surplus when you have retained earnings right all these things are there within the net assets of the subsidiary then i said you have to take it to fair value as per ifrs 3 so there might be some fair value adjustment right maybe the fair value is increasing it will increase on both the ends then the, because of this there might be some additional depreciation additional depreciation will just be adjusted at the reporting date column because it's an year end expense that will give you total net assets of the subsidiary uh at the acquisition date and at the reporting date and the movement between these two is known as post acquisition movement remember this when i'll do intra group i'll ask you so post acquisition movement now this post acquisition movement goes into working note number 4 that is nci nci will have a share in this uh, post acquisition movement in net assets of the subsidiary and it will also go to working note number 5 because parent will also have a share in this movement then you have working note number 3 that is goodwill working note number 3 goodwill so here basically you have two types of goodwill one is proportionate goodwill and another is full goodwill so you calculate goodwill as fair value of consideration paid by the parent fair value of consideration paid by parent right then that could be consideration could be deferred consideration that means whenever there is deferred consideration i need to calculate present value and create a provision on the provision subsequently i will unwind the interest then there might be contingent consideration now this contingent consideration is again to be calculated at expected value right at expected value because what is the probability that you will pay that then there might be share for share exchange so or there can be cash consideration of course so you will see what is the consideration paid by the parent right then you will add nci into it you will add nci into it now if your fair value of nci is taken if the fair value of nci is taken then that is full goodwill okay if nci is percentage in net assets of the subsidiary at acquisition net asset of subsidiary at acquisition that is working note number 2 is taken then that is proportionate goodwill so you take nci based upon full goodwill or proportionate goodwill right that will give you the amount paid by parent and nci together to acquire the subsidiary then what you do is you compare it these are the amounts paid by the parent and nci to buy the subsidiary so what was the worth of the subsidiary that comes from what was the worth of the subsidiary that comes from working note number 2 that is minus fair value of net assets of the subsidiary at acquisition date that is going to give me my goodwill so this is my goodwill at acquisition now in future if this goodwill is impaired goodwill is also subject to annual impairment review where you compare the carrying amount and the recoverable amount if in future this goodwill is impaired this impairment this impairment will be divided between nci and parent only if the full goodwill was calculated that means you took nci's fair value if it was proportionate goodwill then of course it will not be allocated to nci so goodwill's impairment will only go to the parent right so this is the impairment of the goodwill that will give you goodwill at the reporting date here you must know that whenever we have proportionate goodwill we calculate total notional goodwill this is not something that you've done in fr but this is something that you've done in sbr so we calculate total notional goodwill that is the concept you must be aware of that is grossed up goodwill because proportionate goodwill is just partial goodwill just like 80% goodwill i need to calculate 100% so what i'll do is i'll gross it up i'll use unitary method i'll say okay 80% of goodwill is this 1% would have been this then 100% would have been this so that is working note number 2 then if i move on to working note number 3 okay this is working note number 3 working note number 4 nci 
so you take nci at acquisition that is basically based upon uh, whatever was your nci in working note number 3 whether it was at fair value or as a percentage of working note number 2 so you will take nci at acquisition you will add nci's percentage share in working note number 2 that is post acquisition movement if there was any impairment to be allocated of the goodwill if it was full goodwill that will give you nci at reporting date right then you have working note number 5 what is there in working note number 5 group retained earnings so group retained earnings you take parents retained earnings right you take parents retained earnings in that you basically add parents share in the subsidiaries post acquisition movement in retained earnings then if there was any unwinding of interest will be deducted from here if there was any uh, goodwill impairment that will be deducted from here if there was any negative goodwill gain on bargain purchase even that is added here gain on bargain purchase right so that will give you your group retained earning so that will depend upon case to case what is to be added and what is to be deducted that will give you your group retained earnings now in consolidation guys you must know that there is a thing known as intra group transactions intra group transactions so if parent is selling goods to the subsidiary at a profit that could be at a markup or it can be at margin now markup is at cost markup is at cost margin is at selling price right so there must be a recorded profit by parent because it is between the group we say we need to derecognize that profit we need to eliminate that profit so what we do is we pass a journal entry gre debit and my inventory credit for purp that is recorded when the parent is the seller so you calculate the purp on the basis of the inventory which is still there in the subsidiary's warehouse so the goods which are still within the group if the goods are sold by the subsidiary to a third party goes went out of that threshold in hindi we call it as lakshman rekha so it went out of that uh, threshold that means now it has become realized but the goods which are still floating within the group are within the group so these are unrealized so we need to calculate our profit on unrealized uh, items so gre debit inventory credit by the amount of purp then when the subsidiary is the seller what happens when subsidiary sell goods to the parent your journal entry is you adjust your working note number 2 because we need to affect nci as well as parent because subsidiary's profit if i slash subsidiary's profit both nci and parent will have share in it so nci and parent debit and my inventory credit by the pyp now to automatically affect these two working notes working note number 4 and 5 i should totally impact my working note number 2 so that is intra group transaction right now that is relevant to your diploma ifrs as well in sbr there were few other things as well that group statement of cash flow group foreign uh, uh, subsidiary which is there then you have one more thing that is change in group structure right so all those things are less relevant so if i just briefly discuss those things as well what is there for diploma ifrs students this is less relevant but yeah in sbr you've done it that there's a golden door of control right if you pass this control this is a control of 50% if you pass this control till 100% that means you have control in this case you are the parent right you are the parent now if you have 0% to 20% then it's a normal financial asset under ifrs 9 right it's a normal financial asset under ifrs 9 then if it is between 20 to 50% then it's an associate so there are situations of step acquisition and there are situations this is not something that you've done in fr and there are situations of step disposal right so step acquisition and step disposal now guys this revision is for diploma ifr student so i won't confuse you further but yeah i'm just giving you a brief idea that when step acquisition happens you move from one standard to another from ifrs 9 to is 28 then is 28 to ifrs 
so when you leave one standard you bid goodbye to it so till the date when the transfer happens you keep it under that particular standard and then later on you move to the next standard same happens with step dispose right that is change in group structure now when i talk about disposal which is very much relevant to you if you dispose 100% of your goods uh, sorry 100% of your subsidiary so what we do uh, in that particular situation we will say okay if i am disposing my 100% of the subsidiary i calculate a group profit or loss on disposal for that basically i need to take proceeds the proceeds that i'm going to receive by selling the you know subsidiary then what is the fair value of any retained interest so let's suppose if it was a step disposal right if if you've still retained some interest what is the fair value of that very rare you will not find this then what is the value of nci you will be happy about leaving the nci because nci was a headache it was an equity section item you get rid of it you will be happy about it so you'll add nci into it then what else is there uh, you also have things like goodwill on disposal date you will calculate goodwill on disposal date you'll be sad to lose that out so you'll deduct it then you have net assets of the subsidiary so you will see okay net assets of the subsidiary i am sad to lose them fair value of net assets at the disposal date will be taken out that will give you group profit or loss on the disposal of that subsidiary which will go to statement of profit and loss so that's it for the group accounts basics that i want to revise right so group accounts done now let's move on to our ifrs 9 uh then we'll end our basic things that we have done in fr then we'll move to last two standards for the day that would be is19 and ifrs2 share based payment that you've not done in fr but yes they are there in your diploma ifrs so ifrs9 ifrs9 is basically financial instruments so there are two types of financial instruments one is financial assets another is financial liabilities now assets are again two types debt and equity right so what is a financial instrument which is a financial asset in the books of one company and simultaneously a financial liability or equity in the books of other company that is what financial instrument is so debt and equity what i have in debt is what is the initial treatment of all financial instruments i will record them at fair value i will capitalize the transaction cost if the fair value through pnl method is followed then i will not capitalize it if not then the capitalization will happen why did i say minus in case of transaction cost being capitalized if it's a situation of financial liability transaction cost will be capitalized as a deduction because what is capitalization capitalization is a happy process so if you add something to your asset you will not be happy sorry if you add something to your liability you won't be happy but if you deduct something from your liability you will be happy right so that's why i added and deducted transaction cost for the sake of explaining capitalization then i have debt financial asset and equity financial asset let's look at the subsequent treatment i have for the debt instrument i have three methods amortized cost method then i have fair value through oci method then i have fair value through pnl method which method do i opt for i opt for the method which is going to give me which is going to give me uh, two tests business model test okay business model test ccf test now business model test uh, talks about the intention what is your intention are you intending to keep that instrument with you till maturity is your intention to keep the instrument till maturity or your intention is i don't know that means i might keep it i might sell it or your intention is for short term right so based upon your intention that's how you record your asset what is ccf test that i'm going to receive my principal and interest payment only in cash i'll not record or i'll not receive any option etc i'll receive everything in cash what is a example where ccf test is not met convertible debenture so in cases of convertible debenture guys you do not just receive cash but you also receive you also receive 
um, you just don't receive convertible debenture in terms of cash payment but you also receive an option to convert the debenture into share so that option makes it not meet the ccf test so when the ccf test is not met whatever is your intention it will be kept under fair value through pnl right so that is for the debt and equity we all are clear on it now equity has two options fair value through oci and fair value through pnl now fair value through oci is only treated or we only keep the instrument under fair value through oci equity instrument if two conditions are met first is it must not be held for trading must not be held for trading second is what it must be you must have made an irrevocable choice irrevocable choice upon its designation so when you first recorded that asset in your financial statements you made an irrevocable choice that i'll keep it under fair value through oci so if these two conditions are met then the equity instrument will be kept under fair value through oci subsequently or else by default method is fair value through pnl so that is the basic of financial assets now financial liability financial liability can be kept under financial liability by default method is amortized cost but yes it cannot uh, it can also be kept under fair value through pnl in certain rare situations like when your liability is held for trading or to you know avoid an accounting mismatch right these are the two situations when you treat your financial liability under fair value through pnl or else it is kept un under amortized cost how do you calculate amortized cost opening liability plus interest how do you take out this interest using effective rate of interest this goes into the pnl minus any cash paid gives me the closing liability same with the asset right so that's it about the basics of ifrs 9 how do you treat compound instruments how do you treat compound instruments so in compound instruments you basically have the convertible debenture where you do split accounting you you know split the debt part and the equity part so if you have issued a convertible debenture part of it is debt that is it's a financial liability and part of it is shares that is share capital or equity so what is the debt part debt part is present value of all the future cash payments this present value is calculated at a rate what rate do we use the rate of a convertible debenture similar bond without conversion options without conversion options that is what you do for compound instruments for the equity section for the equity uh, part what is this calculated as proceeds minus the debt component will give me the remaining that is equity that's the accounting treatment for compound instruments then you have derivatives i'll not go much into detail of derivatives and hedging there's already a video posted on my channel you can i link the uh description box with that particular link so derivatives is simple you create a derivative and you treat it under fair value through pnl now what is a derivative derivative is simple either it is uh, first of all it is you know not either it is and first second and third all these conditions should be met first is that it has no or very least initial value second is its value is dependent on an underlying item okay the value is dependent upon an underlying item third is that it is to be settled at a future date so if all these con uh, conditions are met we will treat it as a derivative and derivative is valued at fair value through statement of profit and that's it so that is what you should know from ifrs 9 basics and rest if you want to go in detail of derivatives like you had in sbr bedded derivatives hedging all those things you can find the video specifically for that right cool now the last two standards for the day that is ifrs 2 and is 19 not all of you uh, have done this if you are directly doing this diploma ifrs uh, without acca so this might be a little tricky with you but if you have done sbr not fr if you have done sbr you must be knowing about these two standards one is is 19 employee benefits 
so what is important in employee benefits i am just revising it there are two jars one jar is of the pension obligation right another jar is of planned asset this is what i am talking about the defined benefit scheme so the employer says to the employee that i will pay you a retirement benefit of this much and that is defined i will not waver from it so to meet that obligation i need to first calculate present value of that obligation to meet this obligation i might invest some money that is known as plant asset like ppf funds are created so what we do if we contribute anything to this plant asset that is addition to the asset contributions made into the plan if the obligation increases that is known as service cost if interest you know interest will be uh, received from the asset the, that is the income so that will increase your asset if there will be unwinding of interest on present value that is increasing your pension obligation so let's take a situation of net surplus or net deficit that is you have an opening net deficit that means on the opening date your liability pension liability was greater than your asset so you take the net deficit you add service cost to it that service cost can be basically your uh, current service cost or it can be past service cost right then what you do is you deduct contributions from the deficit because i'm talking about liability what is deficit liability minus asset contribution is increasing the asset so if this asset increases the amount which i'm calculating will decrease because net deficit is equal to liability minus asset so contribution deducted net interest component will be added because it is increasing my uh, liability so it will be added benefits paid out have no effect because they will lead to uh, you know there will be no effect in benefits paid out because this will lead to simple money taken out from the asset and the obligation being fulfilled like that doesn't affect your bank balance that doesn't affect your pnl then you will have a closing balance according to you you will have your own net deficit then you will compare it with what figure actually gave you what figure actually gave you in the reporting date at the reporting date now the difference will go to remeasurement component now this remeasurement component goes into other comprehensive income right so net deficit actually value remeasurement component goes to oci this net interest component goes to pnl net interest component goes to pnl contributions goes nowhere it is adjusted in statement of cash flow the service cost again it goes into statement of profit and loss if there is any increase or decrease in the pension liability because of amendment settlement or curtailment that is also adjusted in the service cost so that is the basics of ias 19 that you should be aware of right now ifrs 2 what is important from ifrs 2 share based payment we basically have two types of share based payment one is equity settled share based payment another is cash settled share based payment so when you issue shares or share options in exchange of employee uh, service that is equity settled so what we do in equity settled is we take the fair value we take the fair value so grant date of that particular share option in the cash settled for the share appreciation rights that means we tell the employees based upon the change in share price we are going to make you a cash payment so we create a liability so basically uh, we create an expense expense debit liability credit in case of cash settled in equity settled my journal is expense debit equity credit so here i take fair value of the sar at each reporting date so what we basically do is we make a table where we calculate let's suppose there is a vesting period right now what is vesting period i grant you share options shares or share appreciation rights you are my employee i'll ask you to meet certain conditions so first of all it's very important to know that there are two types of conditions market conditions and non market conditions 
Now market conditions are already reflected in the fair value of the share option share or the share appreciation right. Non-market condition will affect how many number of employees will get the shares or how many number of employees will be vesting. So non-market conditions will change the number of employees. So let's suppose the vesting period is three years. So you will say year one, year two and year three. Year one, we will say, okay, let's suppose 100 employees were given 10 share options each. Fair value at grand date was 11. This is the first year out of the third year. That will give you your equity, okay, whatever it comes up to be. Second year, you will apply the same formula. Number of employees who will get the share options will change based upon non-market conditions. You will say this is second year out of the third. Now you have accumulated equity. Now the movement between second and first year will be treated as expense for the second year, right? So this is how you do the calculation. In case of cash settled, you don't take fair value that is same on all the three dates. You change the fair value that is at each reporting date. Plus one more star point before I end this. Always remember that whenever cash settled share based payment or share appreciation rate is exercised, the cash payment is always made at intrinsic value that will be given to you in the question. So when you reduce your uh, liability, which is created because of a cash settled share based payment, the cash payment is made at intrinsic value that is given to you in the question. So that is it for your revision for the day. I hope all of you enjoyed it. Part of it was related to something that we have done in FR and part of it was related to something that is specific to uh, Diploma IFRS only. So I hope everyone took help from this session. If you did, please do like, share and subscribe and drop a comment down and be sure that you are happy with the concepts. I have shared my WhatsApp number. Uh, you can just, you know, go back to the first slide. If you want these notes also and if you want to get added into the WhatsApp group, please do WhatsApp me plus all the very best for your exam guys. This is my last aid and last address uh, before your June exams. So I hope everyone is doing well. The preparation is well and you are enjoying your preparation. I know you might be a little nervous. That is totally fine. But just have confidence because you have prepared till this date. You have come to this video, you are preparing, that means you're doing something, okay? So all the best, be confident, and I'm sending my blessings and best wishes to each one of those and who are watching this video or not watching this video, may you all pass with flying colors. All the best.